gentlemen, my name is Gordon McCall. I am the Artistic and Executive Director of the Lyric Theater here in downtown Swift Current, Saskatchewan. It's my pleasure tonight to welcome you to Lyric Digital Stage, Write Out Loud number five. It's going to be a wonderful evening of readings. Just before we go to that, I want to say that we acknowledge here at the Lyric that we're on traditional lands referred to as Treaty 4 territory, the original lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Solto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect and honor the treaties that were made on all territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and we're committed to move forward in partnership with Indigenous nations in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Here at the Lyric, we also stand with members of the Black community, people of color, Indigenous peoples, 2SLGBTQ communities, people with disabilities, and all who experience oppressive marginalization and systemic racism and hatred, including injustice of this nature that occurs in our own country. Now, let us begin the proceedings tonight. I want to introduce you to Anne Hill. She will introduce all of our wonderful authors. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Lyric Digital Stage, Right Out Loud, number five. Welcome to the Write Out Loud Digital Stage. This presentation is part of the Lyric Digital Stage program. Thank you so much for joining us on this lovely evening. Our writers tonight are Madeline Smid, Diane Warren, Arthur Slade, and Linda Monahan. Their stories range from the local to the fantastical, always thrilling and evocative. Thank you so much to the Write Out Loud Committee for doing all the work to organize this event and all the technical expertise of the Lyric Theatre for putting it on. Relax and enjoy the show. Hello, my name is Linda Monahan, and I'm pleased to be reading for you today um, on behalf of the Lyric Stage Write Out Loud reading series. Uh, I am the author of four collections of poetry. The most recent one is uh, A Beautiful Stone, Poems and Allulations, which is a book that I co-wrote with a poet friend of mine, Rod Thompson. Um, Rod and I did a lot of poetic experimenting in this book uh, in that we didn't worry so much about um, if a, if a reader could tell who wrote what, but what was important to us was that the poems would read seamlessly as if they were written by one poet. And, and also what was important was that the poems be true to both Rod and myself. So I'd like to share um, a few of the poems from A Beautiful Stone, Poems and Allulations. This poem is called Inheritance. I wish I had a grandmother's hug kind of heart, a plush cushion made of real red velvet, the kind that takes you to the grocery store for a romance novel while others hunt for milk and sirloin, or the practical sort, pillowy and useful as a feather tick after a long day walking wide open spaces a resting place without phones or lists, clean and cottony as a summer cloud, instead of this rickety uncle, this spindle-backed, naked, old, aching kind of heart that runs from others to a shack trapping sagebrush. Um, Rod likes to do a lot of um, fishing and being out there in his his kayak and um, I'm not much of a fisherman but I do spend my summers at the lake and so I know where the fish are and uh, this is this poem is called a fish and fiddleheads one warm spring day out in my new Scott starcraft cruiser I gather a pickerel from the lake where I know they waited just off prospect point and later we stopped on the road to the Narrows. You stood lookout for park wardens, while I, with shovel over my shoulder, tromped into the forest to dig fiddleheads. I'm not one to boast, I'm no native, but it feels so good to step out of the can of winter, hand you a plate of wild white and green to nourish ourselves with the promise of tender days. Uh, Rod and I both um, were writing about our ancestors, about grandparents, 
and uh, this poem is called Rituals Burnished. Confined to the house, grandfather took comfort knowing that out there in the workshop each tool was sharp and up in the beams fresh blocks of larch were drying, chips swept from the plank floor, each chisel and mallet within easy reach. Once a week, grandfather paid me 50 cents to polish his boots. Winter nights in the easy chair, in the glow of his easy stories, I'd open the old red shoe shine box, small flat tins of kiwi polish and carefully folded chamois. I loved the smell of the wax, the way the boots worked up to a fine gleam as I rubbed the paste into the soft leather. I'd line them up outside his bedroom door so they'd be there for him come morning when he'd hand me the 50 cents. I can see my face in these boots, he'd tell me, and I'd walk away smiling, paid in full. This pandemic, I think, has made a lot of us feel um, what we used to call storm stayed. And in some ways, um, being storm stayed can be a really good thing in that it makes us appreciate what really matters. And this poem is called Storm Stayed. Snow splintering the headlights, we arrive at last, and for three days, schedules are canceled, bookings missed, while we watch white cotton unfurl outside our window into a thick, deep quilt wrapped all around us. Home is the snug cave we do not venture from. Power out, we forge together, sharing stories never told before. Huddled in the firelight, we listen to nature howl and dance over the absurdity of our frail goals and deadlines so far away. Uh, Rod and I both live in the forest uh, near Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. And so a lot of our poems deal with the area in which we live, the lakes and forests of north central Saskatchewan. And this poem is titled Loon and I. Black and white photo of families at the beach, mums in rubber swim caps, not a jet boat in sight. Best hiking trip, two days of rain tapping the tent, us in sleeping bags, deck of cards between us. Perfectly happy when the power goes out at the cabin, I light coal oil lanterns, read in the flickering light. What risk taking these long days for ourselves, hike up to that little lake, carve wooden boats. Feeling selfish, I say no to the long list of obligations, pack my bags for a week spent on my own. Back again on the rocky shore, a loon and I, her sunset song, combing my tangled thoughts. I don't think there's a, a poet who hasn't written about the process of writing poetry, the, the work and the heart that goes into it. And this poem is called On the Potter's Wheel. Write a decent poem in every coffee shop, a retirement goal that separates me from the old loners. Writing late into the night at the cabin, I curve into these slow hours. Pencil stacked like cordwood on the desk. Now, if only this one would catch fire. Who writes these poems? Not I, this incendiary tall flick of a woman, casting the heat of her words into the dark of old nights. Some poems fall from the sky, wet ice crystals interlaced, melting. Some poems are frozen clouds of breath. My pen is blue ivory. Few people at the poetry reading, one of them head between her knees, whispering to a phone. Traveled winter roads six hours to the reading, sold one copy to the town librarian. Lump of clay on the potter's wheel, cup, bowl, vase, no wrong way, yet still I'm frightened. Um, here's a poem about grief. It's titled Partners. Paper birch line the lake shore. You wrote me a small poem on a strip of bark the night my father died. 
You crept away before breakfast, leaves falling, sunlight and dew, partners for a time. Grieving, my good friend has lost her father too. I give her a journal to write sorrow in. Old cabin, mossy log softening, but for a small mirror hanging squarely in the curve of time. Evening enters the forest quietly, two old companions, trees and time. The day's cuttings composting in the garden, Robin pulling worms, one thing into another, even the stars. And I, I'd like to read one last poem from A Beautiful Stone. And this one is from the section titled Allulation. And it's called The Asbestos Forest. Lightning strikes to the southeast, a deep-throated rumble. The sky boils darkness. I'm the asbestos forest that never burns. She braced herself against the first question, this young therapist insisting sharing would help. I'm the asbestos forest that never burns. Like the spruce by the river, a strip of bark struck from her breast, a scar she wears, a medallion. I'm the asbestos forest that never burns. She crams so much into the margins between crossed out words. His notes are tidy, tiny letters in obedient lines. I'm the asbestos forest that never burns. Such a good girl, everyone said, looking after her motherless family, little sister throwing tantrums, her brother failing in school. I'm the asbestos forest that never burns. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this selection of work from uh, A Beautiful Stone Poems at All Relations, which is available through Radiant Press. And stay well and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Arthur Slade, and I'm here on the Lyric Digital Stage. I'm very excited to be here. I've been in the real Lyric Theatre a couple of times now and, um, and really love the place, but I'm also honoured to be on the digital stage, too. So uh, I am uh, someone who grew up in southwest Saskatchewan. I was uh, raised on a ranch just south of Tompkins, and so spent a lot of time in that Swift Current area. And I spent a lot of um, I've a lot of my time writing, and I've written over twenty five books now. And most of my books are for middle grade, so that's kind of grade four, five, six, up to teenagers, or people who are young at heart. I also write for them because I find that um, a lot of adults also read books for those those age groups. And I, I'm going to read today from so many of the things that I write. I, I write things that are about Saskatchewan. Uh, I write books that are set in kind of alternate worlds. I write books that are set in Victorian England. So I kind of jump all over the place. And one of the things that I, I um I kind of blame Saskatchewan for, or at least for the, the lovely Saskatchewan skies, is I really feel like whenever I look up at the big blue sky, I feel like I could fill that sky with my imagination. And one of the things that I decided to fill the big blue sky with, not specifically in Saskatchewan, because this book is set in an alternate world, but I decided to fill it with dragons. And so today I'm going to read from a book called Dragon Assassin. And um, it is actually my latest book. It just, just came out back in January. And it's all about a young girl. You can see there's the cover right there. A young girl who is training to be an assassin. And she happens to also ride a dragon. Most assassins ride black swans, but she ends up riding a dragon. And this is the story of how that happened. Chapter one, an eye for an eye. I lost my left eye during blades training at assassin school. My twin brother did the deed, using a clever feint and a quick crosswise cut that caught me by surprise. Well, Carmen, that'll leave a scar, Corwin had said. Then he'd laugh, that snorty, snotty laugh that had grated on my nerves a thousand times since childhood. My vision had been too blurry to aim a cutting blow at him, and I wasn't certain if I even wanted to. He was the only family I had, and despite his laughter, he may not have known how deep the wound was. He often made a silly joke when he had done something stupid. But when I stumbled and fell toward the floor, Corwin dropped his blade and caught me. Ah, oh, sorry, sis, he said, holding me against his chest. Then the healers rushed in with their bandages and led me to the healing room. Maester Elysius, my master, soon brought the bad news. 
You will lose that eye, Carmen. I was 13. I'd been ahead of my brother on the honor roll, the top of the class. I often wondered if a bout of jealousy inspired my blinding. The blades were sharp, but we students weren't supposed to cut each other. The idea was to keep the mind sharp too. And I'd love to know where he'd learned the move. I'd never seen it before, and I was better with a sword than him. Did he have a secret teacher? Everything was harder with only one eye. The sword fights, the dagger throws, learning to avoid traps, even the poisons and potions were more difficult to pour. A half-blind assassin was a joke. I was pretty certain my fellow students had chuckled and celebrated as my position on the honor roll slipped. I had the knowledge and the skill, but the patch over my eye meant I had a weakness, and assassins were trained to exploit weaknesses. I'd have quit, perhaps to be a scullery maid or to work in the massive wheat fields of the Akkad Empire, if only to get away from the other apprentice assassins who now scorned me. I especially wanted to flee from the kinder ones who looked at me with pity. But Maester Elysius had insisted I stay. Adversity will toughen your mental bones, he had promised. His support and my perseverance had kept me in school. Three years had passed since the incident. I was finally 16, in my final week of classes. Corwin would graduate at the top of the honor roll. He was the best with bladed weapons, the best at hiding in shadows, the best assassin the school had seen in many years. He may even be better than the legendary Bandarius. All the kings, queens, and archons would seek to hire Corwin. Maybe even Emperor Rima himself. I'd be lucky. To be hired at all. So that's the, the first chapter of the book and a little introduction to Carmen. And um, one of the things that I, I, I loved about fantasy novels, and still love about fantasy novels, is the whole idea of fortresses. And so I wanted to make my own fortress where these assassins lived. And this is just a little, chapter two is all about the fortress. Don't worry, it's a short chapter. Red Adept Assassin School was a fortress built on top of Mount Egret, and no one had ever conquered it. It was perfectly positioned on the border of the Akkad Empire and between the five realms. The fortress had 308 secret gates locked by the strongest locks, which were in turn protected by ancient, powerful spells. My brother and I were babies when we were left in a box in front of one of those gates. We never knew why we were abandoned, but we did know that a gate opened and an assassin took us inside. We were raised in the fortress to work in the kitchen, to wipe the latrines, to feed the giant black swans. We watched the maestros and the students and we practiced in the dark. We were invited to attend school when we turned 12, which put us on the path to becoming assassins. If everything worked out, we'd graduate, be given our assassin cloaks and ride a giant black swan to our new careers. Chapter 3. The Points. My 14 classmates surrounded me, all seated at a long table set with 15 pestles, 15 mortars, 15 oil burners, and a selection of knives. Piles of dried leaves from several plants, including mint and basil to disguise the smell of any poison, sat in the center of the table. The final exam for potions, poisons, and alchemy was about to begin. We students were a variety of skin shades and body types and came from every realm and corner of the empire. The more shapes, sizes, and colors, the better. It made it easier to complete our mission when we, and then melt right back into the crowd. My brother was at the far end of the table with his two cronies, square-jawed Gregum and willowy and cold-eyed Cilia. They brought out the worst in Corwin. I knew Gregum was from Trella because he bragged about how he had grown up in a walled mansion outside the city. The rest of us kept quiet about our countries because the less information you gave as an assassin, the better. Megan of the red hair and perfect face was directly across the table. She'd given me the nickname of Cyclops, so I'd decided to hate her forever. Next to her was Thord, whom I actually liked. He had blonde hair and was larger than the other assassins, and he'd always spoken kindly to me. To everyone, in fact, though I could do without the pity I often saw in his eyes. Wart's poison, Maester Nestor shouted. I shuddered at his bark command, then smiled. This was an easy one. I gathered the green leaves from a jar, crushed them, and mixed in the oil from black ivy seeds, knowing each exact portion. I was done before everyone else. Maester Nestor came over to sniff my concoction. 
He nodded without smiling. Despite my grinding, slicing, and pestling talents, I was at the bottom of the graduating class. For each assassin's skill, a student would receive points, and I lacked marks in the sword fighting, grappling, dagger work, garroting, and other hand-to-hand -hand combat techniques, all because my missing eye made it so hard to judge distance. But I excelled at alchemy, logic, and finding hidden, hidden messages in secret scrolls. You look puffed up and proud, Carmen, Maestro Nestor said. He had cruel lips that were good at shaping cruel words. Remember, we aren't training you to be an apothecary who cures boils on goats. I expect absolute perfection. I nodded, and he moved on. My empty eye socket itched behind the black patch. No glass eye for me. I found the patch more intimidating. After Maester Nestor had coldly inspected every other student's work, he shouted, Brillig's acid! I gathered the ingredients from the piles on the table, including vitriol of Damon, petrosalt, and alum. Once they were mixed together, it would become an acid that had to be carried carefully in glass vials. It would eat through metal, wood, and flesh. I ground the salt with a pestle, mixed all the ingredients together, and then risked a glance at my classmates. I had to turn my head quite far to make up for my lack of peripheral vision. Everyone else was still grinding. Even Corwin was slamming a hard chunk of salt with a pestle. Good. I grabbed a small glass ball in front of me and uncorked it. The ball was designed to be thrown at an enemy so the glass would smash and release the acid. All I had to do was use the funnel to pour the mixture inside. I lined it up and tipped the glass jar. The smell of acrid smoke alerted to me, my, to me to my mistake. Stupid, stupid eye. My good eye watered up and I pushed back from the smoke, slid on my bench and nearly fell over. I dropped the decanter and a hole began burning in the stone floor. I looked up to see Maester Nestor, Nestor looking down. A smile crossed his face. Not satisfactory, Carmen. Not satisfactory at all. You lose five points. Now clean all this up. I did clean it, using soda, power to, using soda powder to neutralize the acid. The whole time I avoided looking at the other graduates. An hour later, the freshly inked grays were hung up, and I discovered my mistake meant I wouldn't have enough points to graduate. The other students backed away, happy with their own marks, but I was still staring at the numbers. Can I help? Corwin asked. He put his hand on my shoulder. He was in one of his brotherly moods. I'd feel horrible if you didn't get your red assassin cloak. I don't know what to do, I said. I can't get those marks back, and we graduate in three days. You could find a swan egg, he said. Ask your maestro. He'll assign you danger points. I looked into it when I thought Cilia might graduate with higher marks, but I'm uncatchable now. Wild swans are dangerous. He waved his hand, dismissing my fears. You eat danger for breakfast. Remember when we practiced flying? We had jumped from cliffs into deep water and had to learn to maneuver ourselves through the air on the way down. It would make us better at landing on parapets. We got points for each jump. You nearly beat me. It turned out I love flying, if only for a few seconds. It might be possible, I said. I see the competitive fire in your eye. He slapped my back. Get a giant black swan's egg and you'll graduate, I'm sure. Just ask Maester Elysius for the extra points. He dotes on you. I stared at my marks. All that work almost lost. Yes, I'll do it. Thank you, I said. We're in this together. He often ignored me, so this sudden softness from him surprised me. You're the only family I have. Despite everything aggravating about him, he was my brother, and the slash that took my eye was most likely an accident. Or, if it was intentional, perhaps he regretted it. And I'll stop there. And um, I just want to say I really enjoyed uh, reading to you and I really jo enjoyed being part of the Le Lyric Digital Theater. It's been fun and I hope you have a wonderful time with the rest of the show. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Diane Warren, and I'm recording this in my office in Regina for uh, the Write Out Loud series in Swift Current at the Lyric Theatre. And um, I've got this new book, and my last couple of novels, I was fortunate to be invited by Write Out Loud to uh, be part of the reading series right at the time when, when the books came out. So um, kind of felt like a celebratory launch of my last two novels since Swift Current. So 
I was very pleased when the Lyric asked me um, to participate in this um, online program uh, because it coincides with the release of this book. So I'll just talk for a few minutes, I guess, about about the novels because I've been I've been thinking about them. My first novel, um, Cool Water, is about a, a young farmer who was adopted by an older couple and he inherits when they when they die, he inherits the farm. Um, the next novel, Liberty Street, is about the daughter of a couple that own um, a rental house in a small town. When they die, she inherits the rental house, which she doesn't want um, for reasons that I won't go get into, but she stores all the family's possessions in the rental house and then leaves. Um, in this novel, it's set around Regina and it features a, an entrepreneur who owns a brick factory. And again, I didn't set out to do this, but again, I've written a novel, I guess, about inheritance. So um, I'm thinking that must be a theme of mine uh, or something, something that I'm thinking about these days, obviously. So I'm going to read you a couple of sections from this book, but I wanted to give that little preamble about inheritance. So the, the brick plant features you know, from beginning to end of the novel, but I I did something else, I think, that has to do with inheritance, and it's embodied in a handmade teapot. The novel is about a family, I don't think I've given you the title, it's called The Diamond House, um, and it's about a family with the last name Diamond. Uh, the father is an entrepreneur, and he comes to Saskatchewan in the early 1900s, and opens um, a brick plant, the diamond factory plant, which then, you know, the, there's the, the legacy of this brick factory in the, in the novel. But his first wife was a ceramic artist, and early in the novel, she makes uh, a teapot, a white ceramic teapot. She dies very early on in the novel, but the teapot stays on. Um, so I thought I'd, because this teapot to me kind of symbolically embodies the idea of legacy and inheritance um, and story, like all of the stories that go with what a family owns um, and passes on, I thought I would read you a couple of sections about the teapot. So there are two wives in the novel. The first wife is Selena, who was the artist who made the teapot. The second wife is Beatrice, who's a very conservative, traditional uh, family woman. The novel is really about the daughter, um, Estella, the daughter of this second marriage. She has four older brothers who are all destined to work at the brick plant. And she's, I, I won't give too much away here, but she's kind of got, she imagines a future. Um, in the brick plant as well, along with her brothers. But at the same time, she's not like her brothers. She'd really like to be kind of rebellious, maybe be an artist like the first wife. So I think that a, a lot of that is told through the story of the teapot. So the first little section I'm going to read to you is about when the teapot was made. So this would be in the very early 1900s, and it's uh, in a small town in Ontario. The first letter arrived 10 days later, on the very day Selena's white teapot was removed from a backyard kiln. Selena read the letter as she walked to Mrs. Morris's for the unbricking, wearing her pottery apron over her skirt and blouse. Normally, she would have arrived early in anticipation of the magic wrought by the firing, but today she walked slowly, intently reading her letter several times over. And when she arrived at Mrs. Morris's gate, she saw that Ruthie Granger was there watching for her. Selina, for heaven's sake, Ruthie said, we've all been waiting. Are you not dying of excitement? At first, Selina thought Ruthie was referring to her letter, which she quickly folded and slipped back into one of her aprons' many pockets. Then she realized that Ruthie meant the oven, 
which had been fired on the weekend by one of Mr. Morris's men from the factory. It had been a final gloss firing, which was Mrs. Morrison's favorite because she fancied herself a freelance painteress, and the gloss revealed her talent at depicting roses and vines and daisies. Her canvas was generally the most basic of shapes, a humble dish or perhaps an ashtray. In Selena's opinion, the least ambitious of all the shapes possible, although she wasn't about to say so out loud because Mrs. Morris owned the oven and the shed in which the club worked. Quickly, Ruthie said, Mrs. M is beside herself with excitement. She thinks she is about to find her masterpiece in the oven. With the letter safely tucked in her apron pocket, Selena tried to recover from the days in which she found herself. Could it be love already? And she turned into the Morris's yard and followed Ruthie along the side of the house to the back garden where the others were waiting. Finally then, Mrs. Morris said, not hiding her irritation that Selena was what was it, seven minutes late. Ruthie gave her a little commiserative poke in the side. She was the only one of the eight ladies in the club who would dare speak anything remotely like a criticism of their leader, although she would do so only within Selena's hearing. In front of the others, especially Mrs. Morris, butter wouldn't melt. But Selena was happy to have at least a weak and uncommitted compatriot. The ladies were gathered in front of the oven, more properly called a kiln, but they preferred the less technical term, that Mr. Morris had built at the back of the garden. It stood fully bricked like an altar at which they were about to worship. Who wants to do the honors now that we're all here? Mrs. Morris asked. Of course that should be you, Mrs. Morris, Selina said, joining the group, trying to redeem herself. And the ladies all nodded, not a word of dissent among them, since they all knew whose property they were on and whose husband allowed such a thing as a pottery oven in the garden. The firebrick kiln was under a wooden shelter next to the work shed. It was a small kiln with room for just four shelves, stacked one above the other, and a firebox underneath and chimney behind. The size of the kiln placed a limit on the ladies' aspirations, but they were all glad to have any kiln at all at their disposal. Their little club was quite a novelty in town and considered to be a daring departure from embroidery or watercolor painting. Selena had been invited to join more because of her father's position at the bank than for her artistic talent, which she considered to be quite a bit more obvious than Mrs. Morris's, although that was another opinion she wisely kept to herself. On this day, a long table had been set up on the lawn to await the unloading, and the ladies formed an assembly line between it and the oven. Once they were organized, Mrs. Morris removed a brick from the oven door and held it up. The ladies clapped, as was expected, and Mrs. Morris made a great show of setting the all-important first brick on a waiting pallet. Then she proceeded to remove the bricks in the door until the kiln was sufficiently open for the ladies to peer inside from their various vantage points in the line and see the first hints of the transformations that had occurred inside. Oohs and ahs were briefly allowed by Mrs. Morris until she recommenced the removal of the bricks, continuing this time until the door was completely open and the bricks were stacked neatly on the pallet. How is the firing cone? asked Mrs. Dorenstall, trying too hard, Selina thought, to sound like someone in the know. Mrs. Morris once again made a ceremony of the process by removing the clay cone meant to melt at the right temperature and signal Mr. Morris's man to start, stop stoking the firebox and let the oven cool. She held it up for all to see. It had slumped perfectly, and the ladies clapped once again. Selina thought Mrs. Morris was dragging things out a little too much for dramatic effect, but she finally reached into the kiln and removed the first pot, Mrs. McPhail's small vase with a ring of painted roses spiraling up the side. The ladies complimented the artist as it was passed along the line and set on the waiting table. Although Mrs. McPhail expressed her disappointment that she had not managed to distribute the pink color evenly and the green stem had all but disappeared. Selena wondered if the problem might be an uneven firing temperature rather than the quality of the painting, but this was something else she could not say out loud as it implied a flaw in Mrs. Morris's kiln. 
It's quite lovely as it is, Ruby said to Mrs. McPhail, always one to give encouragement. One by one, the pots were removed and the shelves stacked beside the kiln. The stilts that held the wares were dropped in a basket and the ladies determined that the firing appeared to have been a great success. Mr. Morris's man, they agreed, was getting very good at his job on the side. They were down to the last few items and Selina awaited the removal of her teapot, the only piece she'd been able to finish for the firing since it had been so difficult to get the various parts made and trimmed and properly attached. Mrs. Morris was taking her time, admiring her own pots as she came across them, until finally at long last the teapot came out, followed by its lid, and Selina finally had her creation in her hands. She did not remember it being so large and heavy, but still, it was an accomplishment. A teapot is a real challenge, Ruby said. You should be proud. It is, isn't it, she replied, momentarily forgetting the rule of modesty for all but Mrs. Morris. She ran her hands over the warm white surface, the gently curving spout, the handle she had worked so hard at to get the balance right and prevent the pot from tipping too far forward when it was held. She set the lid on and was not even disappointed that a glazed drip prevented a perfect fit. And then she set the pot on the table with the others and she thought it really was the standout piece. The decorating was subtle with just a single green leaf painted under the spout and another smaller one next to the handle. She was less interested in painting and the others were better at it, but there was no one in the group who had ever used the potter's wheel to make a teapot with any degree of success. It's very plain, isn't it, Mrs. Morris said. Is that what you wanted? But let's save our comments for our discussion, shall we? For now, let's all have a pat on the back for a job well done. Well done, ladies, don't you think? Well done, they all agreed, patting each other on the backs of their summer dresses with delicate hands and wedding ringed fingers, all but Selena, admiring their work the still warm glazed surfaces of dishes and bowls and vases, the painted flowers shining in the sun. It was alchemy, Selina thought, the many steps that turned simple earth into things of beauty, flawed things, but beautiful nonetheless. She admired the pots all lined up on the table, having emerged for the final time from the fire. There were flashes of ash from the firebox, but these too she loved for the way you could not control them. She felt a sense of goodwill, even toward Mrs. Morris, who was, she had to admit, a competent patroness, in spite of her lack of imagination and her serious nature. So that's the teapot. Um, Oliver, the, Oliver Diamond, the patriarch in this story, um, remarries a woman named Beatrice. And the next little section that I'll read is... Um, it's set in Regina, so they've Oliver has established his brick plant. It's about to open for business, and he moves west with his new wife, um, and she believes she's come to the wilderness. So they've moved into a boarding house because they don't. They eventually he builds them a house out of diamond bricks, but at this point they they're in a boarding house. In the days after their arrival, Oliver went to the plant with Nathaniel while Beatrice unpacked her bags and tried to get used to the idea that this was now her home. She placed a few of their wedding gifts about to see if that would help. A lace tablecloth, a crystal cream and sugar set, a pink china flower vase. The rooms had come furnished and Beatrice did not think much of her landlady's taste in decorating. The painting above the Chesterfield was dark and brooding, a deer running for its life from the hounds, and she especially did not like the stoneware teapot on the sideboard. She tried to remove the lid, but it was solidly stuck in place, and when she picked it up, she found herself weighing it in her hands, as you might a bag of potatoes in the shop. It was impossibly heavy and unattractive, with no redeeming value that she could see. She was considering hiding it in the sideboard and replacing it with a colorful china peacock she had unpacked when she heard someone at the door. She turned around and saw that it was Oliver. As he came in, 
He was saying something about finding her walking shoes, but when he saw that she was holding the teapot, he stopped mid-sentence. And in that moment, Beatrice remembered that Selena had been in the Burn Corners Pottery Club, and she understood that the teapot was hers. This is lovely, she said, not sure how else to describe it politely. It's not the best example of a handcrafted vessel, is it? Oliver said, and then he added, Selena made it. I leave it to you. If you would rather I throw it out, I will do so. Beatrice set the teapot back down on the sideboard, trying to avoid the inevitable clunk. It had been only a year since Selena's death, she thought, and it behooved her to respect her memory. Of course we will not throw it out, she said, although there's no need to make the tea in it, is there? We have other teapots. I believe we received three as wedding gifts. We'll treat it as a museum piece. Then she looked around for a place to put the china peacock and decided on the kitchen windowsill. Now then, she said, turning to Oliver, what were you saying about walking shoes? He said that he wanted to take her out to see the plant. They traveled from the city along a well-used country trail that took them to Oliver's property. The factory yard resembled a huge excavation site cut into the surrounding hills. And as they drove toward the new buildings, Beatrice saw the brick kilns Oliver had told her about. She counted six of them. She could see why they were called beehives, the shape, but also the number of men working around them. In fact, when they got out of the car and walked closer, she saw men everywhere, even on the roof of a long wooden building where they were hammering shingles into place. Oliver explained that this building was the heart of the operation from one end where trolley cars brought clay from the pits through to the other where the raw bricks were stacked and taken to the kilns. He took her inside and up a narrow staircase leading to his office so she could have a look at the works from overhead. The office had windows on all sides and a catwalk was suspended under the rafters so that every aspect of production was visible. As Oliver led her along the catwalk, he explained what she was seeing below them, a giant pug mill, which looked to Beatrice like something you might see in a bread-making plant, the mold shop, the drying tunnels, the network of conveyor belts and trolley tracks that connected the shops and workstations. It was sometimes hard to hear with all the hammering on the roof, but Oliver leaned close so she got most of what he was saying, and she was amazed that he, or any man for that matter, could bring such a complicated production into being. When they finished their tour of the building, they descended the stairs, the stairs and stepped once again into the factory yard. Oliver took her next to see the kilns and they were able to walk inside one so Beatrice could see the overhead construction that created downdrafts of heat during the firings. Then he showed her the warehouse where the finished bricks would be sorted and loaded onto skids for transport. Horses had been purchased, he said, and would soon arrive from Ontario by train to pull the trolley cars. He pointed out the new barn that awaited the animals. I know nothing of horses, he said, but Nathaniel has hired a man to train them to the harness. Later, they walked out into the quarry hills, and Beatrice wondered how she might describe adequately in a letter home the strangeness of the clay deposits which did not look at all as she thought they would. She'd expected a rust color, like the bricks in burned corners, but instead, variegated seams of pink and blue-gray ran through the cut banks. She felt as though she had gone back in time, and she half expected a giant rep reptile to step in front of her with its teeth bared. There was something disturbingly prehistoric about these hills, she thought. She asked Oliver what happened when it rained, and he told her that the clay sluiced like thick cream. After a windstorm, he said, you might find arrowheads exposed in the surrounding fields. He had found many. She, is qu she was quiet as they walked then, no longer thinking about dinosaurs, but of a time much more recent. Although it hardly made sense, she felt as though they were trespassing. As they looped around and the building came back into view, Oliver said, the West is a new land now, Beatrice, and you can't argue with progress, can you? She didn't know whether you could or not. 
That was Oliver's business. But on the way home in the car, she was overtaken by a wave of homesickness. She was unsettled by this wilderness, and she felt a longing for quiet, conventional Burn Corners, Ontario, and the house she had grown up in. Although she admired Oliver's determination, she wondered if perhaps she should not have replied to his first letter. And this thought too unsettled her because she did not want to be unhappy and believed discontent was something you brought on yourself. She had once been to a lecture with her parents where a fiery speaker from Chicago said that God wanted his flock to be prosperous, that God wanted his flock to be prosperous and anyone who wasn't had only his own insufficient faith to blame. He had lost her by appearing to blame poverty beyond the poor. What had happened to charity? But she did agree that happiness was of your own making, barring dire circumstances. When they got back to the boarding house, she said she thought she had best lie down. She was feeling poorly. She drank the cup of tea Oliver made and assured him that she would be herself again the next day, which she was. She vowed never again to, to let nerves and homesickness get the better of her because she was a fortunate woman to have been there to pick up the pieces when Selina died and Oliver Diamond's life fell apart. So I'll quit there and uh, thanks once again to the Lyric for asking me. My thanks to Gord McCall, Terry Tease and other members of the Lyric Board for this opportunity. Thank you also to the Prairie Quills Writers Group, the Saskatchewan Writers Guild, the Swift Current Library, and the community of Swift Current and area for the support of my writing over the years. The piece I am reading is a short story, a work of fiction written for a collection of mine entitled It Only Takes a Second. The story is called A Way Out, and in seconds, life change. Where am I this evening? Oh yes, Cypress Hills College in Swift Current, a regional institute that like every other wants to provide their budding academics with the best opportunities. It's the end of May and yet spring is reluctant to venture forth on the prairie, afraid of being stomped on by a winter that isn't yet done with us. The drive from Moose Jaw, where I addressed yet another bored group of prayer parent-driven students, did not soothe me as I hoped. Gray clouds rolled over the hills, curling in endless waves of brown, a neutral landscape. I too attempt neutrality as I stand on this platform, spouting my spiel by rote. I suppress my response to the eager light in the young redhead's eyes as she contemplates a brilliant future. Brilliant rarely happens. I don't react to the disrespect of the small group, heads together, their laughter punctuating my words like graffiti. I push down the jutting surprise of my reaction while surreptitiously watching the yummy young blonde slipping out of my presentation. Her attempt at an unobtrusive departure amuses me even as it increases my interest. A female who looks that good in a tight, just below the butt leather skirt can't slip anywhere. But the fact she is trying indicates she is considerate and sensitive of my feelings. I could use a bit of that in my life. In fact, a big chunk. It's time to put up the stats on student loans. A real groaner. The need for papers in my case, which sits on a desk set on the lionel floor of the stage, allows me a few seconds of appreciation for the gentle sway of the sweet little blonde's hips. Shadows hang around the periphery of the room and soon she becomes lost in them, lost to me. I sigh, grab some handouts and send them circulating around the gym. Returning to my PowerPoint presentation, I fill the 10 minutes of wind up before the inevitable and repetitive questions. I wonder where the blonde is heading. I wonder where I am heading. I stand just outside the main entrance of the college, appreciating the purity of silence. A room full of students produces a lot of white noise. A small group spills out of the building, 
Several animated women with white hair focus on a gentleman with black specks and a well-trimmed beard. Within the center of the group, a young woman answers his call. Several dry witticisms carry on the air as the two exchange banter. The guy has a great sense of humor. The younger female emerges from the circle. Bye, you guys. I'll call when I get back from Saskatoon in the fall. Wait a sec. That's the young woman who freed herself from my mind-numbing snaps. Stats. Wonder who this group is. Specs pats the blonde on the shoulder. Don't get lost in the big city, Sarah. He tightens his hand in a reassuring grip, then releases her and walks away. Sarah, nice name, always liked it. But this one should be called Sassy Sarah. There's an energy about it that works like an electric magnet. The people in the group appear so attached, either they feel fit tearing themselves away will be painful, or they need her to cut the current to set them free. With a low voice comment, Sarah releases them. Within seconds, they disappear, leaving her alone. She turns 180 degrees and looks up at the words encased in plaster over the front door. Her bottom draws my attention, tight and curved just right. I'm an ass man. Bye, old friend, she whispers. Turning back, she starts down the steps, sees me, and stops. Recognition brightens her eyes, and a warm blush like rose-tinted light casts itself across her cheeks. Delightful. If I approach her, she'll probably think I'm a middle-aged and desperate. Well, granted, I am. She's coming over. Stand straight, Edwin. Shoulders back. Suck in your gut. My mother's instructions and Sergeant Major's commands overlap in my mind. Joining the Army out of high school gave me the advantages of an MBA, great posture, and a decent physique. I work out every day and look 10 years younger than I am. I travel far more as a body snatcher for the university than I ever did in the Army. Foreign students have the funds, the, their parents the desire to buy them Western education, and persuading them U of S tops every other college in the country is what I do best. A tough job, just about as challenging as looking cool while this fresh-faced nymph approaches me. Hi, Mr. Colfax. She remembers my name. I'm impressed. Hi yourself. Sarah, is it? I cl Sarah Peters. She holds out her hand. I clasp the delicate appendage, surprised at the firmness of her grip. I apologize for creeping out of your seminar. It was rude, but I was missing my last creative writing class, and I wanted to say goodbye before the group left. I smile at her directness. If there's anything I admire, Sarah, it's someone who can prioritize. What makes creative writing more important than career development? Writing is my career. My mind is already made up, but my parents insist I check out my options, so I came tonight. If you plan on writing novels, it's a good thing you did come. A job will subsidize your efforts in the early years. You sound like you write too. Surprise, excitement, and challenge zap across their features. I've published a few things, non-fiction, work-related, more stats. I grin and don't add they are required textbooks in the learning centers across the country. I'm already published in several periodicals. Do you know anything about writing articles? Some. I wonder... This is awfully pushy of me, but will you consider letting me buy you a coffee so I can pepper you with questions? Exhaustion falls from me like dust from a raising car. For token's sake, I glance at my watch. 9.30 p.m. Lots of time to bask in this refreshing breeze. Sure. Do you have a place in mind? There's a cafe two blocks over. I have my car. Want a ride? I debate the pros of more time with her in the intimacy of a vehicle with the cons of placing myself in an uncomfortable situation. My libido is acting like I'm 15 instead of 35. I'll follow you over. I head for my rental. The cafe is dimly lit and almost empty. 
She chooses a booth at the far end. A waitress limps over, fills our cups, and hurries back to the kitchen where she kicks off her heels. Sarah's questions start. They demonstrate she's already researched her topic religiously. This noviet at the art of writing will not be caught by surprise if devotion can present, prevent it. When I give her new information, she smiles, clasps her hands over her breasts as if storing away a precious gift. I search my brain like a treasure hunter turning out a dusty attic for any bits of information or tips she may not have. As the flow of questions dissipate like waves on a barren beach, I prefer, prepare for my dismissal and am astonished anew when I realize the tide is turning into a flood of curiosity about me. Her questions become more personal. I respond fully, floating out anything that might inflate her opinion of me. And I question her. Sarah confides she dreams of traveling the world as a freelance journalist. She says she's not afraid of getting there step by step because that's how most journeys are taken and each step will be part of her life. Her radiant smile acts as an aphrodisiac. I shrink lower under the table. When the waitress stalks out shoeless and announces in a belligerent tone, it's 11 p.m. and she's closing, Sarah and I exchange blank looks then laugh our way out of the cafe. I can't believe we stayed so long. Talking with you is so stimulating. Her enthusiasm feels like a shiny badge pinned on my sports jacket. Her lovely face so full of animation. Cupping her jaw and drinking from her mouth until dawn is all I can think about. I feel young, strong, and capable of anything. Sarah the Alexa shoots through my veins. I know you're older and probably think I'm jailbait, but I'm 23. I started school late because I had a heart defect at birth and waited a long time for a transplant. I'm in top shape now, but the experience molded me. I relate to older people because I've been around them a lot more. Or maybe it's because I received the heart of a woman 15 years older than me. For sure, I value life. It's so precious. I don't waste a second of mine. I find you attractive and would like more time with you. Can we go back to your room, talk some more, see where things go from here? I barely keep from looking heavenward in some cliché check-in with the divine. Can it really be this easy? A beautiful young woman propositioning me. I'm sorry, maybe you're married or have rules about mixing with the students. No wives, no rules. I bark out the words, rushing my reassurance. Will you follow me or come in my car? Wow, I'd love a ride in a Mustang convertible. Sarah sounds young for the first time. I hold open the door, taking great pleasure from giving her a new experience, knowing she will soon reciprocate and give me even more pleasure. We make love like two halves of a rip photograph coming together. She brings the light, the energy, and the curiosity. I contribute experience, patience, and a tenderness I've never felt before. And in one night, in one hotel room, in one small city, on an endless rotation of all three, I stop revolving. While holding Sarah in my arms, I cease my endless spinning through time. Measuring the drum of Sarah's heart against mine, I am awed, knowing without the gifted organ, this wellspring of joy would not exist. Bound together, I slake my thirst for connection and recognition from her lips, reciprocating with a bounty of faith in her, become a platform for her dreams. It's also logical, so plainly our karma. My condo in Saskatoon accommodates Sarah's summer internship with the Star Phoenix. My future recruitment trips to China, Thailand, and Indonesia feed into Sarah's desire for travel. The two edges of the photograph meld so seamlessly you can no longer see the pieces. I know this without looking, 
because I'm living the picture. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Lyric Digital Stage, Right Out Loud number five. That was just wonderful. Special thanks to Terry Taves and the Right Out Loud Committee for making this all possible. To our wonderful authors, Linda Monahan, Arthur Slade, Diane Warren, and Madeline Smid. A special thank you for doing this. And to Anne Hill, our wonderful host for this evening. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, you have helped us so much during this difficult time with donations to the theater and with your help we are going to get there if you uh, would like to donate still all you have to do is make a check or money order out to the Lyric Theatre uh, box 1143 Swift Current Saskatchewan S9H 3X3 or if you want to do an e-transfer treasure at lyrictheatre.ca thank you once again for your support ladies and gentlemen and thank you to these authors we hope you have a great rest of the evening and always enjoy a good book. There you go. Take care. Thank you.